We're back with Dr. Costadino on the third session, talking about the crucifixion of the King of Glory, a book that she has written, an excellent book. And I ask you all to go out and buy it. Every home should have this in their shelves, but not let it collect dust. Read it. That's the important part. Dr. Costadino, Evgenia, great to have you back. Uh, Thank you, Father. One of Thank the you, Father. And you know what, Father, um, a lot of people have told me Holy Week is never the same after they read that book. So I hope that people will try to at least start reading it for Holy Week. And maybe if they don't finish, they can they can finish it next year. But Absolutely. it's got a lot in there that really helps you with Holy Week. Absolutely. The last section we were talking about the Bible and the fact that it is documented and that people believe yes. that. Yes. Well, that's a good thing. But, you know, I think why the challenge comes in before mm -hmm. I ask you the first question I think the challenge comes in because from year to year, decade, century to century, it's the same problem. Christ is causing us, wanting us to live using our free will in a holy way. Yes. And the world yes. is pulling us back the other That's way. Right. So this constant battle, constant battle is going on in people's lives. And many times they sort of like, let me just sugarcoat that. Let me yes my bases just in yes. case this stuff is right. And the other is saying, this stuff is nonsense. Yes. So this is what we're dealing with. And mm -hmm. let me go right to a question about Pontius mm -hmm. Pilate, one of the most mm -hmm. common criticism concerns the yes. portrayal of him. Yes. What would you say to that? What would you say to that? Right, this is, this is one of the most common criticisms, as you mentioned, Father. And I, I found almost all Bible scholars at least in what I've read, maybe the majority say that the gospel portrayal of Pilate is not accurate mm. and um, that is not correct because of what we know about Pilate. So we do know that there was a Roman governor called Pontius Pilate that he ruled in Judea from the year 26 to the year 36, and that he was pretty brutal. He was a very tough cookie, and he had to be to be responsible for a place like Judea. But what they say is that because the gospel portrayal of the trial of Christ, the Roman trial of Christ, Pilate is very anxious to release Jesus. And that doesn't really seem like the kind of person that's portrayed in other historical accounts. Um, therefore, the gospels must not be true. Um, then other, and then they could try to come up with a some kind of a theory for why this is, oh, maybe the church didn't want the Romans to be bad at them for saying that the Romans were responsible for the you know, the crucifixion of Christ. And that's, that's nonsense. The Romans did not persecute the church because we blamed them for the, for the crucifixion of Christ. That's not the case at all. The Romans persecuted the church because we wouldn't worship the Roman gods, okay? So even if we said Pilate was not responsible for the death of Jesus, we still would worship the gods. So this has nothing to do with anything. But People who don't know better, that sounds like a logical argument. Oh, the gospel writers tried to soften the portrayal of Pilate. Well, the fact is, Romans would not have liked the portrayal of Pilate. They, this would not have appealed to them. This, is, this shows how out of touch we are with how people thought and behaved in the first century. Roman society was brutal. So they would not have liked the gospel portrayal that shows Pilate trying to release Jesus, that is actually quite anti-Roman. They would have wanted the tough guy, okay, who quickly put Jesus to, condemn Jesus to death. So there must be some reason why Pilate was in fact reluctant to put Jesus to death. And from my perspective, I've never read anybody else spell it out like this. And maybe this is one of the reasons why the book has been very, very popular. I, I mean, I spell out step by step by step, step what happened and why Pilate, even though he was reluctant to put Jesus to death, decided that he had to anyhow. So one of the things I talk about is how different Jesus was from any other person who appeared before Pilate. And the fact that Pilate, even though he's a Roman governor, and he easily had no hesitation for putting people to death who might be rabble rousers and insurrectionists, he still has to follow Roman law. And he can't just put Jesus to death because he, you know, somebody brings somebody to, you know, they, here's what happened. And this is really described very well in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, the 
Jewish leaders, and by the way, that's the gospel that has the most detail about the Roman trial. The rest are much shorter. The Jewish leaders bring Jesus to Pilate very early on Friday morning. Passover is about to start. Pilate's very busy. He's trying to make sure that all of his men are ready and because there are going to be big, big crowds on the Temple Mount. They want to be sure they can handle the crowds and there's no riots or rebellion. Mm -hmm. What do the Jewish leaders say? Uh, when G First of all, Pilate says, um, what, why do you bring this man here? Now, this also shows us that Pilate did not know who Jesus was. So one of the things that they say is that, oh, Pilate must have known who Jesus is. I just want to tell everybody out there, if you read anybody who says, oh, this must have happened, like Jesus must have been married because most people got married. That's a stupid reason to believe anything. Okay, not everybody got married. Jesus never married. John never married. John the Baptist never married. A lot of other people. So this, he must have, Pilate must have known about Jesus. Well, on what basis do you conclude? How would Pilate know about Jesus? Oh, well, just because Jesus is famous today doesn't mean that Pilate would know about him. Where did Jesus preach? In the temple, Jewish temple, where Romans did not go. In synagogues, where Romans did not go. Among the people in houses, Jesus did not attract Roman crowds. How would Pilate hear about him? How would Pilate know about him? Why would Pilate? The whole, the whole, um, the trap that the Pharisees tried to, how they tried to trap Jesus with a question about the coin, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or not? That was designed to have a reason to bring Jesus to the attention of Pontius Pilate, because otherwise, what were they going to say? Well, Pilate, you know, there's something you should know about. Okay, what is it? This is a busy guy, by the way, a very no-nonsense guy. Well, there's this rabbi who's attracting big crowds. And so what is he saying? Oh, He's telling them to love their enemies <laughs> and turn the other cheek. Oh, you know, get away from me. Why are you bothering me with this? Pilate would have heard about Jesus if Jesus had been fomenting rebellion. But we know that Jesus did not do that. So Pilate never heard of Jesus. So the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to him. And he says, why do you bring this man? And they say, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have brought him to you. And Pilate's reaction is says, take him away and judge him according to your own law, because they had the right to ju judge their own people. And they did. He doesn't know that they already did judge him. But the point is, when they bring Jesus to Pilate and call him an evildoer, that means he has not committed a crime according to Roman law. And there is no statute that you put somebody to death for being an evildoer. OK, so Pilate had to follow Roman law also. He had to keep a log. He had to keep records of everything he did. And he couldn't just put people to death because somebody else wanted them, wanted them dead. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. He had to follow Roman law and procedures also. And so he then they come back. He comes back inside and says to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Now we see that even though Jesus was condemned on the charge of blasphemy by the Jews, that's a religious crime. Jesus cannot be put to death on the basis of that crime. So they have to bring in a political charge. So they accuse him of treason. So Pilate comes back in, starts questioning Jesus about whether or not he's the king of the Jews. So we see how they switched and they come up with a crime. All right. And that probably has to do with the way that he was welcomed by the crowds into Jerusalem, you see, on, on Sunday. So the fact is, when as Jesus is answering Pilate's questions, he's perfectly calm. He's having discussion about truth. And Pilate says, this guy is not a threat. I've never heard of him before. That me, and believe me, they had informants everywhere that would have informed him if there was anybody who was fomenting rebellion. And Jesus says, I have no followers. They're not fighting to release me. You know, P Pilate had put a lot of people on trial. This is one of the main jobs of a Roman governor was to hear court cases, to administer justice. He was very experienced. Most people who appeared before Pilate, how did they behave? You can imagine. They were begging for their lives, especially if they're facing crucifixion. They're begging for their lives. They're offering a bribe. They're suggesting, I need some time to prepare a defense. I want to hire an order. Let me get my friends to testify for me. Jesus has no fear at all. Pilate 
was convinced that Jesus was not guilty of anything. Jesus didn't behave like a guilty person. Pilate had not heard anything about Jesus before. So he comes out right away and says, this guy hasn't done anything. He, I find no crime in him. So step by step by step through the book, I explain what they do to Pilate. But the fact is that Pilate ultimately came to the conclusion, be, becomes afraid. And again, I explain in the book why this is. Because he does not want to put Jesus to death because Jesus is so calm, so so dignified in his demeanor that P Pilate becomes unnerved by that because in Greek and Roman mythology, there were lots of stories of gods coming to earth and terrible things happened to the people who mistreated them. And we might look, think about that and say, oh, that's ridiculous, but not in Pilate's world. Not in Pilate's mind, those things are true. They really believe that those things happen. We have plenty of, you know, Greek myths like Arachne and, you know, the goddess Athena turns her into a spider and, you know, things like this. We, we know these stories, but these were reality for people like Pilate. Even though we might not believe them, that was part of their fundamental beliefs. And so Pilate becomes quite convinced that Jesus is probably a god. And that's why he's reluctant. So you see, the gospel writers know better than modern so-called intelligent Bible scholars who think that they, that Pilate would never have actually behaved like this. But I set out explaining step by step why he behaved like this, and finally why the Jew, he, how the Jewish leaders get Pilate to do what they want. Well, in essence, um, the high priest did not want blood on their hands. They wanted well, someone. Yeah, well, they, they want, yeah, because, well, I've mentioned that too, but they want somebody else to kill Jesus because Jesus was popular, and right. they don't want to be responsible for him, and they want Jesus publicly humiliated and discredited, and that can only happen by crucifixion, so but they, they find a way, they actually blackmail Pilate into having Jesus crucified, so, so sad and, and so when you look at the yeah, when we know the historical details, it becomes so obvious. But unless somebody explains it to you, it's not that obvious. <laughs> it, is, it is. Well, here, here's another one. And this is the one that's really, I've seen this many, many years, misunderstood detail <coughs> about the crucifixion, uh, mm -hmm. his words on the cross. Yes. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, yeah. Eli, lama sabachthani. I believe yeah. those words. Yeah, you, you know it. And you speak about that. Why yeah. is that so misunderstood? Yes. Why, God, have you yes. you left me yes. hanging? Why? Yeah. Why? Um, because, you know, when those words were written in the Gospels, people knew those Psalms, and they used to recite them in the church. In, in the, this, because the, the, for the Jewish people, the Psalms are the hymnal of the Jewish people, and those and the Psalms are a big part of our worship service even today in the Orthodox Church. So what people don't realize is that when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is quoting the first line of the Psalm, the Psalm that is numbered 21 in the Septuagint or 22 in, in most English Bibles. And most people don't know that surprisingly, after all these years, you, you know that father, of course, but I still find people who have no idea about this. And it sounds like Jesus feels like God has abandoned him, okay? And this also, I think, become popularized by a lot of Protestant preachers who say that at that moment, Jesus was feeling the whole weight of the sins of the world and the wrath of the Father was raining down upon him, yes. et cetera. And that, that's, of course, is, is not only nonsense, it's, it's blasphemy because the Son was never separated from the Father. We believe in the Holy Trinity. You can never have a separation of the Son from the Father. Jesus didn't feel that God abandoned him. He was praying the psalm, which was a prophetic messianic psalm. And he couldn't say, uh, Psalm 22, everybody, <laughs> because, because yeah. the psalms were not numbered at that time. This, they, the first line of the psalm is the title of the psalm. Just like for us, if we want to say, um, everybody, let's all sing um, the, the hymn of the, let's say, last Sunday, which was the Sunday of the Holy Cross. So, so, don la onsu. Okay. We don't say, sing hymn number 153. We don't number our hymns. Right. The title, the first line, or Deep or, or whatever it is, 
the first line of the hymn is the title. So it was like that for the Psalms, for the Jewish people too. So Jesus says this, and he's either praying the Psalm, or he's calling it to the attention of the people who are at the foot of the cross, because it is prophetic. And so many of the things that are described happening at the crucifixion scene were described in the Psalm. So the prophecy is being fulfilled, but there's more to it even than that. Mm -hmm. The last third of the Psalm changes and it becomes a song of glorification, exaltation and victory. And the Lord is showing that at the, the last part of the Psalm and I describe it in the book, the Lord is, talks about how I will stand in the midst of the congregation and I will praise you. So he's saying that he's going to come alive again, that people will come to the knowledge of the Lord by these events. They, the whole world will come to the Lord because of what is happening there at the cross. So it's as though he is saying, if you're, if you're losing hope, if you're doubting right now, just say, sing this psalm in your own head and you will see that it ends up all right. So far from being a cry of despair, he's saying that it will end ultimately in his vindication and victory. Well, that is an explanation. Let me tell you mm -hmm. something. That's beautiful. That That's is right. wonderful for people because I have heard it over and over and exactly what I've heard many pastors say. Yes. It's the weight of the world and the, the Trinity has been split and the son oh, is here and the oh, father. It's impossible. Oh, That's gosh, ridiculous. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me change a little. Luckily, bit. not not by Orthodox priests. They know enough not to say Ooh. that the Trinity is split, right? I don't know. I don't know. Really? No few, kidding. I've wow. Heard a few that are on the edge. That, that's a that's a problem. That's let's a not go there. Yeah. Let's not go there. Um, let's change a little bit here and look at uh, medical science for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. Can any conclusions be drawn by medical science about what caused the actual physical death? Of Christ? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question, because we, we have to acknowledge, again, theologically speaking, the Lord chose to die because he was sinless. He was not subject to death. They could have, you know, tortured him endlessly. He would not have died unless he chose to die. So we cannot say that something caused the death of Christ the way something causes our own death. And there have been at least, I found at least 10 different explanations for, for the death of Christ, for the physical death of Christ. There have been a number of medical books and some articles written about this. But um, we can't know uh, because, you know, that would, and, and by the way, for crucifixion, it might, the actual cause of death might depend upon the person, their age, their physical conditioning. But um the, the top, the leading, I think, con contenders for most people's death by crucifixion is, is a hypovolemic shock mm -hmm. and a tra or traumatic shock. Um, some people say ruptured heart. That's probably unlikely, but it's not impossible. And I explained that in, in the book. But and also um, asphyxia has been the leading. Is um, is a that, and I, I thought that too, because... Um, for, for decades, I've been talking about the crucifixion, and one of the leading books about the, the death of Christ and the crucifixion of Christ was written by a French doctor in the 1920s. His name is Pierre Barbet, and he's the one who came up with this theory that people couldn't breathe as they were hanging on the cross. Mm -hmm. And this mistake has been propagated again and again and again. And I had read that and other people said that it was from asphyxia, the pe pe people couldn't breathe as they were hanging on the cross. And uh, there was one medical doctor, actually a coroner in New York state that disproved this. And I read a lot of his writings also, and I explained why this is not true. Um, people, the, the idea was that when people were hanging, and there, it is true that when somebody's arms are extended like this, Actually, it's very difficult for the, the intercostal muscles. Those are the muscles between the ribs to, to allow them to expand and contract as they be, become spastic and they're unable to do that. And there's tremendous pain involved with this. But um, it's, it didn't really seem to, when, when people actually, this particular uh, coroner, his name is Zugibi, conducted experiments with young men on a full-size cross in which they strapped them by the wrists and the uh, by the feet to a full-size cross, they found that they had no difficulty breathing in that position. It was very painful because yep. they began to have spasms in their chest 
and their shoulders, it was, it was unbearably painful because they were in this fixed position, but they didn't have any difficulty breathing. And they also could not push themselves up on their feet the way it was described by Pierre Barbet, that the crucifixion victims had to push themselves on their feet and lift themselves up like this to take a breath and to, to completely exhale and to completely inhale. They were unable to move. Anybody who was, uh, and it's to my knowledge, Zugibi is the only person who actually tried to conduct experiments to the extent possible and monitor the heartbeat and the oxygen saturation level and other things like this. I think it's, it's very, very persuasive. So the, if they died of asphyxia, it was because they could not get enough um, oxygen through the body, but that had more to do probably with blood loss mm -hmm. and the fact that Jesus had probably a hypovolemic shock, which means low blood fluid. So he lost a lot of blood with the scourging. He had sweated a lot. He hadn't drunk anything. So um, as, as he, he, it was very difficult for the blood to circulate oxygen through the body. So asphyxia, by the way, it means you don't have enough oxygen. Right. You die of suffocation, basically. So if you consider also the fact that hanging on the cross, even though we have in our icons, Jesus's body is pretty straight on the cross. We know that in order to nail the feet to the cross, they had to put the, the bottom of the feet flat against the wood of the cross. Yes. And to do that, they had to bend the knees significantly. Like if you're lying in bed and you want your back to be flat, you have to bend your knees a lot. So mm -hmm. as crucifixion victims were hanging on the cross, they weren't straight like that. The, the knees were bent. And that, and that along with a low amount of blood volume because of the blood loss meant it was very difficult for the blood to circulate from the heart all the way down to the feet and come back up and bring that oxygen. So- um, Plus the nails in the hands, right? And they're just hanging Yeah, well, but, right. But that, that, that didn't cause a blood loss. That was just extraordinarily painful. painful yeah. the, the, the rubbing of the nails against the, um, against the nerves in the wrist and the hands and the feet was excruciatingly painful. Well, I'm, so, uh, I'm very, very, pleased and I feel blessed that God gave you the wisdom. Oh, thank you, Father. I appreciate that. I appreciate to that. Put this together for people because you're offering a tremendous amount of information that really people need, especially in today's world. They're thirsting so much yes. to learn the truth. Um, let's talk a little bit about your opinion. I've got only one more question for you after that, but okay. one more opinion as a result of your research yes. turning the passion. Did, did anything change? Did anything change in, as a result of all this research? Yes, well, um, I, well, uh, first of all, my opinion about how the manner of death or how Christ might've died uh, changed because I found all this other information that disproved this uh, French doctor's theory about asphyxia. But I think what happened the, the most really had to do with, um, with, with my appreciation for what Christ experienced, I think. I, not that it changed, but it sort of deepened for me that understanding of, of what it meant when he said something like, I thirst, because we've all been thirsty. We know what it means to thirst. But when we consider how, how much he blood he lost, and when he talks about thirst and what he experienced as a, as a real human being, we, we should never minimize that. I think it, it brings home for us a greater appreciation because I went into some detail about even things like the crown of thorns. We understand that as a mockery. We understand the shame of that, but to understand the, the pain and yeah. what caused that pain and the severity of the pain and why the pain of a piercing of somebody's skull uh, with the thorns, the, the kind of the extent of that pain, I'd never read anything like that before or knew how extremely uh, painful it was because of the specific nerves in the head. So I think I just developed a, a deeper appreciation perhaps. Okay. And uh, finally, what about the details, the crucifixion or the passion of Christ? Do you think that yeah. Christians today do not fully understand? I mean, there's a lot in there. I'm sure you can yes. do it all. 
practically pick one or two. just pick one or practically two. everything i would say that some of it of course is why he was crucified a, a lot of it again has to do with judas the role that judas played the the reason why Pilate acted the way he did even the reason why the jewish leaders acted the way they did and jesus is you know their concern about the temple for for me it had a, a lot of it i think that was the most revealing and i i was was had to do with the piercing of christ's side and the, and his death at passover the and the fact that there were two different views of the messiah that were very popular at the time two different ideas of the messiah and that the jews today still expect that there will be two different messiahs that was very surprising to me and so this is one of the things that i think was very beneficial to me because i read so many jewish writings that um that sort of illuminated for me what what jews are thinking about Passover, how they understand the meaning of Passover, the meaning of Isaac's sacrifice, how they used to actually sacrifice the lambs at Passover, and the connection, and why we call Jesus the Passover lamb. That, that sort of thing, I think, was very, very meaningful. Well, we encourage everyone to purchase this book. Is it available in electronic form? Audible? Yes, yep. it is available as audible in a book, uh, to, so you can listen to it. A lot of people find that useful. It's electronic. It's, a, it's available electronically on Kindle and other, you know, on the Ancient Faith, uh, store.ancientfaith.com or on Amazon if people want to buy something through Amazon. It's in all formats and there's uh, amazing things in the book. I wish we had more time to talk about, but I thank we'll you very again. much, Father, yeah. for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. We'll talk again. Again, folks, uh, the crucifixion of the King of Glory, the amazing history and sublime mystery of passion. Please get this book for your house and sit down, especially now prior to mm -hmm. Holy Week. This is a great opportunity to really yes. delve into it. It's almost as if you're taking a pilgrimage. Yeah. Almost Thank take you, a Father. pilgrimage. Get this book yes, and read it, pray about it, and may God continue to bless you. Dr. Cosedino. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you, Father.